today, today, today. Today is not only your birthday. Yeah, today is your birthday. It's not only your birthday. Today you're to receive the biggest promotion of your life. It's an important day. It's, you're going to get honour and respect. Everyone's going to be looking up to you. It's a very special day, except you find yourself sitting by a river all alone on your birthday. See, you're depressed by the fear, the dishonesty, the injustice, the immorality, the hopelessness that's all around. Not to mention that you've now missed out on this respect and honour that were you were due. And it's all out of your control. It's not your fault. And friends, this is Ezekiel. This is where his story begins. And in the coming weeks, we're going to be tempted to make excuses for what we discover. We're going to be tempted to say, well, that was then. This is now. Our God, he's grown up. He's matured. He's that warm and fuzzy, cuddly, Santa Claus-like character that we're tempted to Often we're told he is. We're going to want to write off Ezekiel as a depressed prophet with PTSD. As one of my Bible college teachers did. Can you believe that? Well, I'm sorry we're not going to get off that easy. We're not going to waste our time on 48 chapters because there is some amazing stuff here that's going to encourage and grow us. We're going to discover that God is the same yesterday, today, and tomorrow. We're going to find God expressing through Ezekiel in no uncertain terms just how horrible and how offensive it is to put our trust in money, to put our trust in governments and ourselves and idols, just how horrible it is and offensive it is to God when we turn our backs on him and make gods of everything else from sex to money and to power. But there is hope. There is some hope here in this book. Ezekiel touches on it over and over again. Except for him, this hope required great faith. For it was just out, just over the horizon, just in the distance, just out of sight. But for us, this is not the case. Our hope is real. Our hope is, it's tangible. It's here. It's now. For God said, for John said this in John 3.16, for God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son, whom shall believe in him, will not perish, but have eternal life. Well, today's message is going to go like this. We're going to pray because I haven't forgotten to pray. I know it's a longerish intro, but we're going to pray because we need God's help. We're going to talk a little bit about the world around Ezekiel on this, his 30th birthday. We're going to talk a little bit about what he saw and what God said to him. And I'm going to close talking about what it is to be called by God because we are all called by God. Let's pray. Loving God, please give us hearts to hear your word. Give us, open us up to receive what you have to give. Help us to be encouraged and fill our hearts with hope. In Jesus' name. Amen. Who's ready for the book of Ezekiel? Yeah. We've got a couple of people. Well, now I know what you're thinking. I do know what you're thinking. I'm, I'm, I know you're thinking. I did mention when I was on holidays, we're going to be preaching through this book of Ezekiel, all 48 chapters. And I know what you're thinking. You're thinking that I made this decision while under the influence of some bottled optimism. <laughs> That's what you're thinking. Well, I, well I, I, look, I might have had a few. No, I didn't. It's okay because I'm sure God wants us to look at this book as sure as I can be because there are some real truths here, some, some details about God's character uh, that we often miss. And I, Anyway, let's start with that history I was talking about. The year is 592 BC, some 600 years before Christ. And one of God's people, a prophet Ezekiel, a prophet and priest, he finds himself on his 30th birthday as a captive in the pagan city of Babylon, taken from his homeland by force, a captive. And this happened because five years earlier, the notorious Nebuchadnezzar, this is a brutal people, a brutal king. 
He had attacked the city of Jerusalem. He had killed Ezekiel's king, looted the city, and took captives back to Babylon. And he did this to teach them a lesson for siding with Egypt. See, it turns out that this now dead king, he had sided with Babylon after Egypt's army's humiliating loss and defeat at the hands of Nebuchadnezzar. To only flip-flop back in support of Egypt when Nebuchadnezzar failed to take Egypt itself and he retreated. History would say that this is kind of this flip-flopping, this betrayal of Babylon that turned Nebuchadnezzar's attention and wrath upon Jerusalem and Ezekiel's people. And it's what would lead to the complete destruction of Jerusalem, of the city. Now, this isn't exactly Ezekiel's story. For we learn that it was God himself who packed his bags and left Jerusalem. We learn that God himself left, his presence left their city and their temple. For Ezekiel is witnessing what he's witnessing in Babylon. And then it was God who used this brutal pagan king to exact his wrath and judgment upon his people. A people that he had brought out of Egypt. He brought them through the desert. He had blessed them so much. They'd become so prosperous and wealthy. Why would God do this? Well, that's easy. They turned their back on their creator and instead they'd put their trust in their money and their idols, they'd put their trust in their government and their selves. But there's much more on that in the coming weeks. Instead today I'm going I'm to begin talking about these faces on these crazy looking creatures that we just talked about. It's in verse 10 and he said this, Oh, that's the title. God will strengthen. Anyway, we'll come to that. Their faces looked like this. Each of the four had the face of a human being. And on, one, and on the right side, each had the face of a lion. On the left, the face of an ox. Each also had the face of an eagle. All right, so you remember this picture that we, we read? Can you, I don't know if anyone got a picture or it just turned into a big muddle. I know the first few times I read it, it turned into a bit of a muddle. And I need some help. I need three more people. Do you guys want to come up? Three people. It's really easy. Come on. Come on. Who's got? Do you guys want to come? I need two more people. Come on. Oh, yes. Come on, Julie. Thank you. Yeah, you're making this awkward for me. <sighs> Gee whiz. All right. Okay. We've got four. All right. We need to stand back to back with our arms out like this, not in a square. So you, you stand there, arms out. Yep. You turn around here that way. And you there. That way. You face that way. Yep. And I face here. So this is what he's picturing these four creatures like this with four faces. We're looking like this. And when we move, we're going to walk towards the band, but you've got to keep your head looking straight ahead. So go slowly, walk, walk, back, yep. Yeah. So you've got to look like that. Okay. And they've got wheels underneath. That's enough. And there's a platform on top and this great, this great image of the glory of God. Okay, you can grab your seats. So that's kind of what I see that Ezekiel is explaining. So some have said that these, these four-faced creatures People have said lots of things about this passage. They're saying that these four-faced creatures are an example of God's perfect nature. Strong like an iron, like a lion, diligent like an ox, intelligent like human beings, and all-seeing or divine like the eagle. Others have said that it's an image of the future. It's, it's, a, it's a portrayal of Christ himself. Christ, as he is explained in the four different Gospels, he is the Lion of Judah in Matthew, He's a servant like an ox in Mark. He's the perfect human in Luke. And, of course, he's divine like the eagle as the son of God in John. However you look at this vision, one thing's sure. We can't write this off as the imaginings of a depressed prophet on his birthday, sitting by a river, missing out on all the glory that he was due. We can't write it off at that. We can't ignore it with that classic line, what's he smoking? You just can't. This is God's word. As, as Timothy puts it, we can guarantee that this will be useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness. Who come to church for some teaching? A few people did. Easy one. Who come to church for some rebuking? Oh, we've, we've got two or three. Who come to church for some correcting? 
The numbers are getting down, aren't they? Who come to church for some training in righteousness? And that's how to be right with God, all right? So that's, that's, that's why we're here. All right, back to these creatures. These creatures that he will name later are the cherubim. Now, does that ring a bell? The cherubim that was sitting, that's the, on the Ark of the Covenant, right? So there's these little creatures. They were there from the beginning in Genesis 3. It was the cherubim that were left at the gate to guide the way back in, to block the way back into the Garden of Eden. The cherubim are there at the end in Revelation 4, and they're singing holy, holy to the Lord. And I think the point of them and these perplexing visions is this. Our God is so great. He's got some adjectives for God. Our God is so strong. strong. Our God is so mighty. I mean, that's a song. Nothing I've got. No, that song wasn't going into that. I know we led there. It's trouble when you want people to say something and they don't say it. It just ruins it, doesn't it? Our God is great. He's strong. He's mighty. He's amazing. He's wonderful. He's He's awesome. He's majestic. He's sovereign. He's all-knowing. He's powerful. He's, what is it? Praiseworthy. He's, what? He's, we're running out of adjectives, aren't we? He's omnipresent, omnipotent. He's forgiving. We're doing way better than I did. I sat here trying to write down all the adjectives I could think for God, and I ran out pretty quick. Holy. He's holy. <sighs> Come on, let me keep going. Let me keep going. You, you guys are doing wonderful, right? There are, there are, we will run out of words eventually for how great our God is. We start repeating ourselves, and that's the point here. Our words can only go so far to explain just how other and how holy the God who created us is. And Ezekiel takes this to the next level, doesn't he? He takes it to the highest level possible with such vivid imagery, such out-of-this-world imagery, so out of this world. But what he's expressing, what he's explain, explaining can only be exactly what he says it is. And he tells us what it is in verse 28. This was the appearance of the likeness of the glory of the Lord. Is that a letdown? This isn't even the glory of the Lord. This is just the appearance of the likeness of the glory of the Lord. But again, this is important because do you think you could stand before the real glory of God? No one could stand before that except Christ himself and to live. And Ezekiel knows that. This is why it's, it's, it's something of that. And at this site, what does the prophet do? Well, it's in the text. When I saw it, I fell face down. And I heard the voice of one speaking. He said to me, son of man, stand up on your feet and I will speak to you. Now, the son of man's not to be confused with Jesus. Jesus was the son of man. Ezekiel is a son of man, like we are a son of man. And he goes on, he said, he spoke. And as he spoke, the Spirit, now that's the Holy Spirit, the breath of God, the Ruach, came into me and raised me to my feet. And I heard him speaking to me. Now let's stop again because I want to be sure that the significance of the Holy Spirit here in this Old Testament story is not lost on us. See, we know God's poured out his Spirit upon all people. We come to faith and God fills us with his Holy Spirit. So for us, it's kind of like a cup of tea. Is it? No. A cup of coffee maybe, a bit stronger. Maybe it's a coffee with a, what is it, a Russian coffee? We get the bit of whiskey in it. Have I got the right word? No. Okay, I'm going too far, I'm told. Well, the point is, right, <laughs> the point is the Holy Spirit was only for a select few, only for a select few in his time. Only a select few were to receive these hearts of flesh, as Jeremiah had said. Only a select few were empowered to do the work of God himself, as the risen Christ had said. Which means if we have this same spirit that Ezekiel's received here, we possess the same power of the Holy Spirit. And we possess the same responsibility of being called by God to be his witness. Why the blank faces? Are you wondering how long this is going to be, maybe? It's incredible, isn't it? That you Christians 
You possess the same power and the responsibility of the Holy Spirit that's going to carry Ezekiel through the darkest valleys. You have that. Can I get an amen? Now we're in agree. Now we're in agreement. Who do you think God's speaking to next? Chapter 2, verse 3. He said, Son of man, I'm sending you to Pembroke Street. Son of man, I'm sending you to Maitland Street. Son of man, I'm sending you to Church Street. Son of man, I'm sending you to Firm Bay. Son of man, I am sending you to Kuma. to a rebellious nation that has rebelled against me. They and their ancestors have been in revolt against me to this very day. The people to whom I am sending you are obstinate and stubborn. Now, of course, I'm being a bit cheeky here. God's speaking to Ezekiel, not to you and me. <laughs> Yet the parallels, they're uncanny. See, Ezekiel's people, they were looking at their situation and all their unanswered prayer. You're gonna, we're going to enter into this, and it's, 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 it's a horrible situation. I've only just scratching the surface this morning. Zika's people, they were blaming everyone else for their unanswered prayer, blaming everyone else, calling this whole problem, this, this being dragged off to Babylon as just bad luck, just the result of a God who's oh, he's not that active. Not that powerful, maybe. Not that interested in us. He's just letting us suffer. And at the same time, they're believing in their past prosperity. This is after, this has happened after a time of great wealth and prosperity. They're trusting that that would somehow come back and continue. Trusting in their government, they might make the right alliances and defeat Babylon. They're trusting in their own strength, all of this to save them. Now try this on for size. Insert bushfires, floods, and COVID as our bad luck. Insert China, climate change as, as the ones to blame. And hasn't our response been exactly the same? For we too are blaming others. We too making, we're making idols of our wealth, our government and self. We're putting our hope in things that will not save us. And this is Ezekiel's story. This angers God. This angers God. So say to them, this is what the sovereign Lord says. And whether they listen or they fail to listen, for they are a rebellious people, they will know that a prophet has been among them. Wait a second, how are they going to know a prophet's been among them if they have failed to listen? Well, that's easy. God's going to do exactly what he says he's going to do. And I think hindsight's going to go like, ooh, it'll be a bit late for many. Much more on that later. Because I'm going to close talking about what it is to be called by Ezekiel. And there's four things we see in these closing verses that I think are of equal importance for us today. Four things that God is saying to us here today. Firstly, verse 6, and you, firstly, do not be afraid. Verse 6, you, son of man, do not be afraid of them or their words. Do not be afraid, though briars and thorns are all around you and you live among scorpions. Do not be afraid of what they say or be terrified by them. They are rebellious People. It's three times God said to Ezekiel, do not be afraid. And as Christians, we can be many things, but we need not be afraid. Yet, yet I'm the first to admit that I'm afraid. Tempted to be afraid, perhaps. Maybe not afraid, maybe more tempted to be afraid. Tempted to kind of shrink back into a corner. Of what? Not catching COVID-19 necessarily. I mean, all things equal, that really shouldn't be a problem for me. But I am afraid of what would happen if an outbreak started right here in this church. Firstly, it's likely some of us wouldn't survive. But putting that to one side, could you imagine 
what the community would say. Well, wouldn't Facebook go off? Could you imagine what the media descending on our little quiet town would say? Could you imagine what our bishop would say? <laughs> Who do you think would get the blame? It's not a laughing matter, is it? A bit worse, right? <laughs> this is what really worries me. Does anyone think ministry would be possible here afterwards? Does anyone really think we could continue ministry here after? Maybe. God is sovereign. God can do anything. But it's a worry, isn't it? Well, that's me. What are you afraid of? You know this is coming back at you. What are you afraid of? What's raising your anxiety levels? What makes you want to retreat? What makes you want to stay in bed? What makes you want to go to the gym so you're not thinking about things? Or having a few beers at night to help stop whatever that is? What's raising your anxiety levels? Whatever it is, God says to you and he says to me, do not be afraid. Do not be afraid. Do not be afraid. And secondly, God says, speak the truth. Verse 7, you must speak my words to them, whether they listen or fail to listen, for they are rebellious. Anyone here who has had a rebellious child, and there's going to be quite a few of you, have had rebellious children. If my mum was here, she might say, I am one. I don't know. I'll leave that to her. But if you've ever had a rebellious child, and, and Alice and I, we have taken two teenagers through their rebellious years. I can tell you, I can attest to you, how pointless it seems to be to tell them the truth, right? How pointless it is. It just seems to like be like water off a duck's back. You just say, look, you know, don't go out drinking. It's, it's not going to end well for you. I want you not. Yet God says, do it anyway. God says, suck it up, Ezekiel. Tell them the truth. Why? Well, some may listen. But actually, I think telling the truth is for us more than it is for them. Because unless we speak the truth, we may be tempted to believe their lies. We may be tempted to think that God doesn't care, that God doesn't know our situation. We might be tempted to let God, we might be tempted to be led into their rebellion. So God says as well, he says, do not rebel like them. In verse 8, but you son of man. Listen to what I say to you. Do not rebel like that rebellious people. Open your mouth and eat what I give you. And that's the last thing, isn't it? Consume God's word. Like Ezekiel, the only way that we're going to resist being like them is on a strict diet of God's word. And this, of course, reminds me of what Jesus said when he was tempted by the devil in the desert. And the devil said to him, turn those stones into bread. And Jesus, what did he say? He said, devil, man shall not live on bread alone, but on every word that comes from the mouth of God. Do not be afraid. Speak the truth. Do not rebel. Consume God's word. Let me wrap all this up. Brothers and sisters, we need not fear COVID. We don't need to fear it. We don't need to fear the community, the media. We don't need to fear the scorn of this world, rejection, poverty. None of it's to be feared. Instead, we must fear God. For God will not let injustice go in, un, will not let injustice go unpunished. God will not remain quiet, and He will hold all to account. No wonder the psalmist said the fear of God is the beginning of wisdom. See, this vision of God's glory, it was not where it was supposed to be. God's glory belonged in the temple in Jerusalem, yet here's Ezekiel seeing this glory in Babylon. Their sin, and their idolatry, and their worship of sex and government and all that stuff had driven God's presence away. Lastly, for those who are not Christian, maybe someone's joined us from home and you don't have this relationship with Christ. You're not yet right with God. 
Or perhaps I've made a grave mistake in speaking the way I have this morning. For I'm told that Australians in particular, we do not respond well to threats or authority. I mean, we see this, don't we? We, we see it in like, the states with the most COVID rules and the biggest fines have the least amount of compliance. I mean, we see it. That's us Aussies. We just don't like that. We push back. Well, I've got two answers for you. Firstly, the stakes are just too high not to speak about this stuff. That's what God's saying to Ezekiel. The stakes are just too high not to speak about this stuff. What it means to be in rebellion with your creator. This is not a fight you can win. That's the honest truth. We act as though there's a decision to follow Christ. We often talk about, you got to make this decision, say the sinner's prayer, become a Christian, it all becomes peachy and rosy. Well, the truth is, it's not a fight you can win. You might get away with 10% over the speed limit. I know I have for 25 years. 10%. I shouldn't have said that out loud. 10%. I don't know if that's a thing if you're allowed to get 10%, but I've certainly got away with it. Anyway, I've got, look, you might get away with 10%, but you push it and you will get caught. This is not a fight you can win. So stop fighting God. Ezekiel is going to push every button. He is going to hold back nothing. So just a few people, just a remnant, might turn to God and live. This whole 48 chapters, you wait till you see the brutality and the, you wait till you read it. You'll do anything to see just a few turn to God and live. And secondly, if we don't speak the truth, who will? Certainly won't find it on social media. In the newsroom, or our politicians. So, brothers and sisters, whatever you are going through, stop fighting God, turn to Christ and live. Put behind you what's beneath you. We're going to pray about that in a moment because it's with God and only with God that there is no need to be afraid. God doesn't say, don't be afraid because. God doesn't need to give you a because, because in God there is no need to be afraid. With God, you can turn your back on the enemy. You can turn your back on the devil. You can say to, to whatever he tempts you with, you can say to him, this is a fight you can't win. I mean, how good is that? Whatever he's pushing on you, whatever he's trying to send you into that you know is not right, you can say to him, this is a fight you can't win, because I am a child of God. With God, you can speak the truth. With God, you don't have to conform to the changing expectations of others. You don't have to follow them in their, to their depravity. With God, you can consume his word, knowing that this time is not wasted, that you are loved, you are protected by the one who created you. Turn to God and live. This is the message of Ezekiel. And this is the journey he's going to take us on now for a number of weeks. Let me pray. Oh, Lord, thank you so much for your great love. In your son, in Christ, we can turn to him. And all who turn to him will live. They will have eternal life. They will not perish. And we thank you, God, for that. We pray you just convict us of our sinfulness before you and help us turn to you, Lord. In Jesus' name. Amen.